Hi, I'm Becca Otis from Five Lines Pottery in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm Ryan Durbin from RD Ceramics located in Southgate, Kentucky. And welcome to Wheel Talk. Hey guys, we've loved answering all of your questions so far. If you'd like to hear your question on the podcast, please send them to us on Instagram at Wheel Talk Podcast or by email to wheeltalkpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks. Got it. Live. Live. Oh, holding, <laughs> holding it. I was. Live. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Oh, classic. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> How you doing? Good. Autumn's my little shoulder uh shoulder buddy. Parrot parrot here. Yeah. Hi Autumn. Oh, she All can't right. hear me anyway. Yeah, she cannot. How was your day, Ryan? It was uh work as usual. Doing yes. that getting up at nine AM kind of deal. Uh or starting at nine AM. Uh Got some glazing done in the studio. I'm about to fill another kiln up. I announced my mystery box sale going live next week, so Sweet. I think this will be out before that. It's going live on the 21st of September. Nice. Which is a Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And hoping to... I, I think I'm going to pack up some mystery boxes beforehand just to, like, get ahead of it. Okay. Because I... I assume a lot of people are just going to buy one box and just kind of end it there. So I yeah. feel like it would be good to just pack up like 10 to 15 and just say like, this is a box that has firsts in it. This is a mm-hmm. box that has firsts and seconds and like label yeah. them appropriately. And then it'll save me time when I actually need to pack them up. Cause yeah, totally. I did that last time. Did yeah, you? I did that where, well, I didn't really pack them. I just put the stuff in the boxes did you, you know? already, like, individually wrap pieces, and then you just had all the pieces wrapped? No, I kind of, well, what was nice for me is since I needed to know how many boxes I had. I think that you probably already know how many boxes you have, but, like, I didn't know how many pieces I was going to put in them, so I just, like, laid out all the boxes and just shoved pieces into them. Yeah. And then, and then wrapped them once I got them. But it was still easier that way, other yeah. than the last time where I, like, just pulled off of a shelf and just, like, randomly put shit in stuff. Did you actually like sell them out quickly? Oh my god! Like your quantity, because I what I did last time was I just set it for like thirty boxes. Yeah. And then started packing immediately, and then inevitably I still have some left over the next day. Yeah. So once I get it all packed up, I get to look at like what I have left, and I just like add ten more to the quantity or whatever. Yeah, this was during the TikTok craze, the TikTok moment, you know. Yeah. And I sold like thirty of them in like ten minutes. Okay. So it was like a yeah, total Yeah, and then you flip. get overwhelmed because you're like, okay, 30 on the board. I got to pack up 30. Right. And Well, and it was like, okay, do I have enough for 30? And I was also doing the mystery boxes of the bisque too. Yeah. But you weren't limiting the quantity. You were just filling an entire box. You weren't saying three to five pieces. You were No, saying... I was. For the bisque one, I was. And for the other oh. one, I didn't really. So, oh, okay. yeah. okay. Gotcha. Yeah. It was a lot. It was a lot. Anyway, so sweet mystery box sale. That's exciting. Yeah, I we were ta- I was talking with Rachel about it because we're closing potentially on the house on the twenty fourth, mm-hmm. and we're we're trying to figure out. I was like, I kind of want to do like the twenty third to give myself like two weeks ahead, so I can actually tell people and like email my mailing list and let them know. Yeah. Since I never email them, and then like give people time on like social to set the reminders and shit instead of giving them like four days notice um so yeah we decide on the 21st that'll be i feel like that's a good buffer like three days or so before we Mm -hmm. start hitting it and uh i'm thinking about rachel helped me with the photographs for the like carved mugs that are seconds and i'm thinking about announcing that they will be part of the same restock because i think i can get those ready too Nice. So people can get mystery boxes as well as the seconds pieces that are mugs that Sweet. are carved. That way we just get all of it out at one time. Otherwise, yeah. I'll like wait and then we'll start moving shit. And then I'll be like, uh, I got to get rid of these. And then it's going to yeah. clog up the time in the evening. So Yeah. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Nice. 
I'm trying to do less wet clay work. I want to call the wet clay to be done at the end of this month. Like, no more, no more wet clay for a bit until I'm working in the new studio. Yeah, yeah, wet yeah. Clay. So, I think that's smart. For yeah. sure. So we'll see how that goes. But I'm I'm like caught up on most other things. Yeah. Like I've got one, I got one commission, and then I just got a wholesale today for a bunch of saucers. For like 45 saucers that's for like somebody wants to use them for soap dishes so i think i've got those ready to like finish glazing and then all i gotta do is finish them so nice should be pretty sweet, sweet. so that's my day how about you oh my god today was so fucking weird i was like i woke yeah, why up why were you working so late yeah i don't know i just got really distracted today for some reason it was just like i don't know I fucking got to work at 10 a.m., 10.30. Are you, are you doing more work with um, people being out? Like, you all are down a trimmer, or did you fill that position? We're not. We're Oh, yeah, because Josie got in a car crash. No, um, I, meant, I meant you had a trimmer that left. Well, she hasn't left yet, so she's... Oh, okay. She's, she, but, yeah. some, but somebody is... You're down a person? Yeah, we're down a person, but we're up a person, too. Up a couple, because we've gotten new people... And then um, we're hiring another new person next week. He's coming to start next week. And I would bet bottom dollar he listens to this podcast, but I don't know for sure. So. Uh, oh. And then... And then um, it's just uh, a he. There's plenty of he's out there. You don't know. You never know. You don't know who we're talking about. Yeah, you don't know. Um, and then, uh, let's see. I don't know what happened today. I feel like... Has the rest of your week been kind of on par? Today With, was just just kind of an oddball. No, it's been a weird fucking week. It's been weird. Um, yesterday I trimmed. I always feel like Wednesdays are a little strange, but like we had lunch and then we came back and then I started. Oh, I made. I I started a little later than normal and I did crumbles. I mean, I threw 140 pieces today. It's not like I didn't make a ton of pieces you know mm-hmm. so i did 70 crumbles and that took me longer than normal and then i and then i made these uh tall thumblers like tumblers with thumbprints in them and like they, the cocktail cups kind of thing yeah well i mean it's this oh okay so it is yeah a tumbler. so I gotcha yeah it's a tumbler but it's tall and um yeah, they just took me a little bit longer than I thought. The clay was a little bit more firm than, uh, you know, than I'm used to. My hands hurt a little bit more. And then I got distracted a little bit as well. I work okay. much better after everybody leaves. Yeah. So Do most people leave at, like, a typical, like, 5 or 6 o'clock thing? Or? Yeah, like 6, 5. And then I kind of, like... I talked to Abby for a little bit, and we kind of worked together, and yeah, so, I mean, I did, I don't know when I started them. I don't know. It was just a waste of a day, but it doesn't matter, because, like, I don't mind being there. It's just... (laughs) Yeah, it just took longer than you expected. Yeah, it just took longer than I thought it would, and it was... um, That's fine. You're bound to have days like that, so... Yeah, I'm, like, it's fine. I don't mind. Um, whoops. Don't be unplugging your headphones, Becca. Oh, well, my headphones are twisting, and it's really bugging me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I'm trying to, like, twist the thingy, but it's twisting my hair. Yeah, don't do that. I think I got it's it. It's no good. Okay. Um... Yeah, so it was fine, and uh, Rebecca got a kiln in this studio now. That's very exciting. Yeah, I saw it outside, so that's one of the five, I'm guessing, right? That is one of the five. It's a, um, yeah, so that is a 27, 28, so 27 inches. Damn, that's a big kiln. Wide, 28, yeah, it's a 10 cubic foot kiln, and... um, so mine that I got is a seven cubic foot kiln. 
Which I'm kind of bummed about. I kind of, like, now I feel which like Which is I, still at the studio, I'm guessing, and is not at your studio yet. No, but I talked to somebody, and I'm going to borrow his trailer on Friday, and I'm going to take it over to the studio. So <laughs> I will nice. be the last person to have my kiln installed. <laughs> but Yeah, it's, so um, there's three that are actually at Rebecca's studio for the Graves Co. Yeah. One of them is yours as well, and then one of them got to the her right second so personal studio personal studio so five total oh and this is exciting i didn't even think about this wait did i announce it did i announce that i would no i don't know if i did did i um, i don't think so i don't know what you're announcing but i would i don't think so the record no no oh okay so, i was just thinking about you the other day actually we were talking to somebody and rachel mentioned it what yeah, you, Rachel so what just you, can't shut about? up about it. She literally cannot shut up about it, and it's hilarious. <laughs> what she, did you tell her? I told Rachel, and then she keeps telling everybody. <laughs> oh, I mean, she just mentioned it in passing. I didn't know that this was, like, official or something. She Okay, anyway. So what uh, the hell are we talking about here? So I've decided that I'm going to try to break the world record for throwing. And the last person that broke the record. For throwing what? Throwing cups, I guess. Cups. In an hour? The most in an cups hour. in an hour? Most cups okay. in the hour. And the last person that broke the record um, works at Sunset Hill Stoneware up in uh, Milwaukee area, like Wisconsin. And um, that was, he seems really cool. And his company, like, super backed him. And it was 212 in an hour. And so... My goal is to beat that 212 in an hour. And, um, yeah, so I can't do it with my personal wheel because it's too slow. Like, the torque is fast enough, but it doesn't stop slow enough. So Rebecca has a Shimpo Light, no, a Shimpo Whisper here. And she said that I could use it to practice on Nice. So, okay. And that way I can just come down from the shop, use the same clay, and just rework it, you know? Yeah. So the news is you're starting to practice? I'm starting to practice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so so you're saying you actually told Rachel this in the last few weeks or something? And oh. she's, when she brought it up to whoever she was talking to? Is she, okay, so... It was because you talked to her about it? No, remember, I told you guys that I wanted to do the record, and then she was like, we can make it a whole thing, have, like, a winery, oh, uh, right. and, like, okay. a woman's business, and I told... I think that um, was for our trip, you, we were talking about that. Yeah, maybe. and I told Link that I wanted to do it, and she'll donate the clay uh, from Kentucky Mudworks, and, ha- like, and I can be part of Graves Co., so it's, like, three women-owned businesses, so it was really cool. And, and then find, Rachel, like, a local winery yeah, or something. Yeah, and to- Rachel was like, we should find a winery that's owned by a woman, and she's just really stoked about it. <laughs> Which I love because I love that. She's going to be your event planner along yeah, with like, whoever else. I love that she's like more excited than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you kind of need that to yeah. like and motivate you because. She, yeah, because I feel sometimes like if you, I don't you're do like, it, I'm yeah, if you don't Rachel push down. me. <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. definitely like, sometimes you need a little push. Yeah. To s- stick to something, you know. But I decided a while ago that I wanted to do this. I just haven't had time to kind of like get going. And like Tim C said, you know, if you need any help at all, let him let him know. And and um, it would just be really fucking cool to have a woman be the title holder, even if it's for a short time, because I'm sure somebody's gonna be like, "Fuck you." <laughs> I mean, I feel like it gets. When did the last winner win it or do it? 2018. 2018. And or 19. Before that. 18 before or that. Was Cherico the winner no. before that? No. It was 2017 before that, and then it was Cherico. Okay. I think. I feel like his was like 2015. Like, it was a while ago, right? Yeah. 15, 16. So, and the differences between, like, what's really cool about Sunset is that they donated all the cups that he made to the Girl Scouts, and they did, like, a fundraiser, and they, you know, so that was cool. And they all looked really good. Like, you know. Like, he, he made that many, but they actually. They looked like solid look good. cups. Yeah. They looked like solid cups, and they put their logos on them and everything like that. 
um, certain people in the past who have beat the record did not make beautiful looking pieces. <laughs> well, some of that is you know what the you know what the number is, so you know what you're shooting for. Just like if yeah. you beat it and you set it at two hundred and forty five instead of 212 like they're gonna have to beat that so they're gonna have to find efficiencies and you know yeah so i'm just saying efficiency is part of it besides the yeah what what tools you use i'm just saying that the quality of product was really good the last time so yeah well i think part of it is the tools you use like the wheel you use the that's true the if you use a sponge if you don't if you Use a lot yeah. of water when you're throwing. I mean, all of that factors into it, right? Yeah. And Cherico did his with a fucking kick wheel, which is phenomenal. Like, can you yeah. imagine your legs at the end of that? Oh, my God. Yeah. Just get in the fucking groove. I mean, that's also part of it, too. Like, that, you kind of yeah. get into the groove. You know the re- repetitions and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Rachel brought it up a couple of days ago, and she was like, yeah, she's going to throw them, and then, like... She was talking about the bats, and I'm like, you don't throw these on a bat. Or you put throw them on, like, one bat, but you're not taking the bat off. I'm like, you're not spending an extra six seconds taking a bat mm-hmm. off, putting a bat on. You're you're throwing it, taking it off, like, barely stopping the wheel. Yeah. And you got to figure out how to get your hands and fingers under it so it doesn't, like, fucking warp it. And your clay has mm-hmm. to be firm enough but hard enough that you can take it off the wheel. And there's, like, specifications that you have to have. Like, they have to be between – the rim has to be between four and five inches wide. It has to be wider at the top than at the base. It has to um, have some sort of a lip on the rim. Uh, Mm. So whatever that may be. Like uh, with Sunset Hill, they just made it wider. Which you can tell that somebody like who never did pottery wrote these fucking rolls. And um, yeah, I mean, some of them looked like fucking planters. Like when I saw Cherico's, I thought they were planters. I didn't know. I thought they they were. were planters. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but I, I mean, like, they don't cups. say that it has to be a Come cup, on, yeah. you know, it just has to be a vessel that yeah. is wider at the top than at the bottom. And if anybody's thrown anything, you know that that's actually easier. <laughs> so, right. so it's like, it naturally it wants to go out. Yeah, because like, so. naturally it wants to go out. So anyway, but so the, the and it current, has to be a certain amount of weight or something, right? It has to be 600 grams. Yeah, I think it's 600 grams. Yeah. So that's about a pound and a quarter, I think. And it's plenty of clay. Yeah, it's not a little bit of clay. I mean, it's certainly. Yeah. A bit. You're probably gonna probably gonna do like a two pole thing or something and mm-hmm. call it. Yeah, I have tr- I've done a few quick practices of just like one piece, two piece, three piece, you know, at a time. And the current record is at 17 seconds a piece. That in- it includes the throw down, the pull off, you know, all that shit. Um, mm-hmm. I have done it in 12, but nice. you have to keep that consistency, you know? Yeah. So, but we'll see. It's definitely a, a, definitely some body training in there, too, I'm sure, and making sure that, like, your back doesn't kill you or, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be nice to come down here with 50 pounds of clay and just kind of, like, go at it and just try short-term, like, you know, Throwing mm-hmm. 10 at a time and seeing how fast you can do it 10 at a time and then progressively get that, it better. I think it would be interesting to, like, document, like, are you trying to throw the fastest you can in five minutes? And then do you scale it up to 15 minutes? Is it like a marathon where you you run three miles and then you, like, the next day you run five miles and then you run, like, 10 miles, yeah. seven miles? I'll have to like, look. I'll have to do some research and see what the best approach is for a marathon because that would be a good comparison, you yeah. know? And then yeah. it can, and then what do you do, like, your body wise? Like, is it best to, like, the chair is probably good, and then like, mm-hmm. how high are you to the clay, and like, right? Do you have the clay on the right, the left? Right, totally. Yeah. Yeah, and like, what um, is beneficial for like Sunset Hill is that they make all of their wheels. They have like their own engineer that makes all their wheels, their tools, their stuff, and so. And they sponsored the event, essentially, so they paid for everything, because you do have to pay some money to, to do it. And, like, yeah. you And if you guys want to watch, all you have to do is search um, record, uh, like, record throwing pots in an hour 
I think, on Google. Uh, Guinness Book of World Records, pottery. Yeah. You could probably look record pottery, Sunset yeah. Hill, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's on Facebook. They did a Facebook Live, and they, like, narrated the whole thing. It was great. <laughs> you have a Wheel Talk exclusive. You yeah. get live commentary while Becca's throwing. Yeah, and they... Um, and they also wrote an article on how to do it yourself if you wanted to. So they were just really cool about the whole process, I felt, you know. Yeah, that's like challenge me. Come on. Kind of, but also just like try it yourself. Like, yeah. Yeah. Why not? That's a cool challenge to do. And like, yeah, I mean, he already has the record, you know. And, and you yeah. know, what's really cool is that he didn't know how to throw before working at Sunset Hill Pottery. And he'd been throwing for only five years. Wow pretty good yeah i mean there's some amazing throwers that have only thrown for like a year or True. you know two years or mm-hmm. yeah all right we should probably we've been talking for on. almost 20 minutes we've been talking yeah. for 20 minutes should we uh... i mean we were talking about pottery so we... i know i know and, yeah anyway moving on what I are think we gonna do be today? exciting for people to hear about so yeah all right so we're gonna do kind of a listener question episode we got a list of i don't know what is this like 15 maybe sure we got a variety of them. There are technique-related ones. There are business kind of related ones, art show-related ones. Yeah. So we'll just kind of go down the list and uh, see what we come up with. Yeah, so. we like doing these ones because it's like everybody has these questions, and we always have a bunch of questions, and so yeah, it's good to feel bad sometimes because you get some questions and you feel like they get backlogged. I'm yeah. sure they kind of forget that they asked them because they're kind of doing us a favor by asking questions but yeah. some of them are like time specific they're asking yeah. for art shows for coming up and they actually want to know the answer and then hopefully they listen and actually hear their questions so yeah if we know that your question is time specific we usually answer it personally in the like in the chat but then yeah and we'll, messages yeah. and then we'll yeah. actually talk about it on an episode in the future if we need to yeah yep okay ready all righty. Let's start at the top. Uh, first one, trying to figure out a better way to, d to dispose of my dirty throwing water in my basement studio. Right now, I'm filtering it through a pillowcase, something I found online, but would love to know if there's a better way. I rent, so trying to find something that I don't need to do any plumbing for. That's from Saffron Ceramics. Okay. It's kind of like a, a like no-sink situation, right? Like you don't want to risk the plumbing. Right, right, right. So, it says dirty throwing water, though. I mean, if it's just throwing water, I would be totally fine with just dumping that in the yard. But Well, it sounds like they're... But if it's chunky and it's, like, reclaiming. Yeah. If so... it's reclaiming, I feel like it's kind of like a reclaim episode. Like, I would... I'd probably pour a plaster bat, if you can, like a one-inch plaster bat or one-and-a-half-inch plaster bat and reclaim it on there once a week or once every three weeks or something like that depending on how much you're throwing that's what i would probably do but if it's the water part i would probably let it settle and then dump off the clean water in the yard and then collect the slop yeah i think i'm like trying to i'm trying to like i'm this brings so many ideas in my brain and i'm trying not to make them like what I <laughs> like w worry that they got to do too many things or yeah I'm trying not to be like you should do this and this and this and this and this um <laughs> okay so what I would suggest is if you're really worried about plumbing situations I don't know if you have a sink in your basement at all um my first thought was oh just do it like pour it in a sump pump but um if you don't have a sump pump, then don't do that. But, yeah, I've always thrown mine in the in the yard. Uh, but if you don't have a yard, I think that what I would probably do is... Um, I feel like you have to collect it and let it dry out or something and then throw it in the trash. Yeah. That's what I... So what I'd probably do is this. Especially... Well, now that winter's approaching, which just kind of makes it difficult. But sometimes people's winters are super dry. So... Like, yes, a pillowcase sounds nice. I think that I'd probably actually get a, um, like, a planter and plug the hole up with a cork or something and pour it in a planter and then put that in a, an alternative bucket so it kind of, like, seeps out the water but keeps the clay in the planter. I would try that um, just mm. because an earthenware planter isn't is, – is, 
it'll you know, it'll let the water filter through it is that what it, you mean it should it should let the water filter through um that's what i, I would was maybe... thinking you were gonna say fill it up with all the slop and then you could probably dump the slop onto something to dry out but i thought you were just gonna say get a cheap like terracotta one dollar planter dump it fill it up and then when it dries out like dump it in the trash or throw the planter away no with all the no, crap. no no i was thinking more you could probably use that as some sort of like a filter um to get the water out but because then it will filter it clean but also obviously i think you know pouring it in just a five gallon bucket and letting the top water come up you know and then you what you could do is just transferring them to new buckets like if you had a three bucket system you could do you know pour it in initially um pour off the top water to that one into the other bucket and then let that one settle and pour off another one into like a one gallon bucket and then dump that in the sink and then once you have all of your slop in that one gallon bucket then you could take it outside if you needed it to dry pour it on some fucking cardboard put it out in the yard or put it out on your deck Mm -hmm. let it dry and trash it or you could reclaim it yeah the pillowcase is a great idea for reclaim, just in general. I've never used it for... Yeah, I would, I would assume if they're, they're filtering it through a pillowcase, they probably have a tree to hang that over or something outside. They have some kind of yard or something to hang the pillowcase because if you live in an apartment, I'm guessing you're not hanging a pillowcase in your apartment. Well, you could do it in your basement. Sink. You could hang it in your basement over a bucket. That's true. Okay. You got some options. Yeah, I mean, if you really if you're really worried about it, put a bucket if and if you have a bucket outside, put it outside and just um make sure it's not in the rain's way and just pour it out and let it evaporate, you know? That's also a good option. That's an option, yeah. But um All yeah. right. Yeah, def- definitely keep the amount of stuff out of the sink if you can. Even if you're like rinsing your hands off like just keep a five gallon bucket with like clean water on the side and like wipe your hands off with a yeah. a big like car wash sponge or something or mm-hmm. one of those wide yellow ones and just clean your hands off in that bucket and make sure all the stuff settles to the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there are so many options. I mean, you can also look at clay trap systems. You know, if you do have a sink down there, you could look at clay trap systems and that would help significantly for... Um, mm-hmm. And they have some DIY them. versions too. Yeah, there's super cheap DIY versions if you have the right size sink and stuff, or a Glyco trap, which is only a hundred bucks, and they work great too. So, yeah, that's what I would probably recommend. Uh, Glyco trap, they use them for dental offices for plaster, and so. Um, but that's what I used in my studio, and we put barely put anything down the sink, but it's still. It still found its way. Is that something you could, if you leave the place, you can disconnect and take with you and reconnect yeah, the old absolutely. stuff easily? Yeah, absolutely. And they say you're not supposed to reuse the buckets, but they're, they, it comes with, like, two buckets that you can, like, screw in. and Because um, you're just going to dump out whatever's in them, right? And then just Yeah, I always used to dump it out and throw some bleach in there and then, you know, bleach it out and then just put the other one back on. So Yeah. Cool. Yeah. They right, work quite well. They're not amazing, but they do work quite well. So, Cool. Cool beans. All right. Bold over ceramics. What do you hate that most people love? This could be clay related. This could be not clay related. Should we do a clay related and a not clay related? I'll let you start clay related because I had a non clay related ready, but. Okay. N- um, clay related. I hate gold luster. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Most people love. Most people love. Um, I hate trimming feet on mugs. Boom. Boom. Shakalaka. I don't think it's necessary at all. There you go. What? I don't is know some... if most people love it. I don't know if it's potters that love it or customers that love it, but I just think it's overkill. Mm-hmm. I don't think a trimmed foot is necessary on everything. I can get down with that. Okay. Uh, what do you hate the most people love in daily life? Seltzer. Oh, like sparkling, yes. Sparkling anything. Get the fuck out of here. Flavored sparkling water. You're truly that you're drinking. That's bullshit. I, it's terrible, honestly. <laughs> I was telling him before this. I, I hate sparkling anything. Oh, my God. Somebody left these Trulies in my 
my uh, fucking my refrigerator and i'm like couldn't you have bought brought beer or something like was it at least a mixed pack or something so like there's yeah. some different flavors in the mix raspberry lime and blueberry acai or acai or whatever acai you, i think acai is how you say or, it. yeah they're they're just not good they're just not good just not this whole craze of the seltzers i just don't get it i like bubbly water i love bubbly water but um I'm more of like a lime bubbly water or a lemon bubbly water, and that's that's about where I draw the line. Yeah. And I'm not a LaCroix fan. LaCroix. <laughs> <laughs> LaCroix. Oh, my gosh. Did I tell you that story about LaCroix? No. I was at the... Val's husband, Val Flynn's husband and I were at Safeway in Whidbey Island, which is this, like, hoity-toity kind of island in Washington. And uh, <laughs> he loves LaCroix. And he... He was like down the aisle from me, and I was like, "Did you get your Lacroix?" <laughs> and I'm like yelling it down the aisle from Safe, and he's like, "Yeah, I got my Lacroix." And this guy could not handle it, and he was like in between us, and he goes, "Um, it's pronounced Lacroix." <laughs> and we're like, uh, "We know." <laughs> Fucking La Tr- Lacroix snob over there. <laughs> we're like, we're we're joking. Um, can't even handle a joke man can't even handle a fucking joke um uh things that i hate that normal people love oh i um well this kind of goes for you i hate coffee i'm not a fan of coffee i don't like coffee either yeah i just never got it smells good yeah i think it smells good i mean i'll drink it occasionally but like very very occasionally um same with beer fuck beer yeah, you don't like beer. I love beer. Uh, and I don't like anything vinegary. Pickles, get that shit out of here. I love you all like the vinegar. And stuff, don't you? All of it. I wonder if that. I wonder if that's like a taste bud thing. Do you think that's like a? I feel like it's a love or hate thing, right? Maybe. Like, there's not people that are just like, eh, I'll, I'll, like like nobody that just randomly like kind of likes pickles like has a pickle jar and they just go in there and like unscrew it and just like eat a couple pickles. Like that just doesn't seem common unless you just fucking love them. I love pickles. Yeah. You know, I have a friend that hates pickles but likes other pickled things. Oh, I know. I hate hiking. <laughs> like the the act of hiking or the destination of hiking? Like the, like the the reason you're hiking, which is to be like outside and like seeing scenery and stuff or just like the physical act of hiking? I don't understand why you would walk up a hill to walk back down it. It's because of the experience. It's like it's like you're getting exercise. You're in the fresh air. You're tuned out from the phone and stuff. I mean, you might take pictures when you get to a destination, but it's like... Well, I have an excuse as well because I can't hike. I feel like that was part of the reason you don't like it <laughs> because you like have ankle problems and stuff. Like You can't physically do it because of your joints. I'm more of a stroller anyway. Like, I feel like... Like, if you could be in a stroller and somebody pushes you. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, if I could stroll up An a adult hill, stroller. Or a That's stroll. called a wheelchair, Becca. <laughs> <laughs> if I could stroll up the hill, you know, like, frolic up a, a mountain, I like would a, much... Like a skipping... <laughs> I don't know. Like, I just feel like hikers are so intense. They're like, ooh, we have to go hike, 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 hike. Maybe it's because... I mean, of- but, but I feel like they're not pushy about it, though. I feel like they're like, like I like to hike. They're not You've like, never lived in Washington. When we go travel somewhere, <laughs> we're going on a hike. Like, I'm coming to travel. I'm going on a hike. I got I to gotta set aside four hours. And if you want to go, you can go, or otherwise I'm not going to see you. Like, is that a thing? Oh, yeah. Really? Fuck, people in Washington, all they do on the weekends is hike. Okay. Hike, 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 hike. Hike, are, are, hike. Is it like, and they, they probably hike a lot of the same places they always hike, right? No, they, there's so many different places to go. Okay. Yeah, it's like a fucking cult. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. What is the best w- slash worst time a cat has gotten into your pottery stuff and made a mess, destroyed things? <laughs> I know Becca has has a few stories, but I haven't heard really any from Ryan. 
That's from Ashley at Bold Over. Yeah. Uh, that's because my cats are well behaved. They don't get in my shit. Um, I would say probably just Ouch. like. What? Ouch. My cats don't steal sandwiches out of people's hands, okay? <laughs> oh my gosh. I fucking had a Chipotle burrito. I sat on the counter the other day and then I like went over and threw something away. Marvel got a hold of it and I like grabbed at the burrito and she like moved her head away and it, the whole thing, it was like, it was like a third of a burrito just stuck in her mouth and I tried to grab it and then she's like flailing around and I have to like grab her and then like grab the thing and rip it out of her mouth so she had a big chunk in her mouth still oh my gosh yeah my cats are well behaved okay in the studio they're well behaved (laughs) my cats are well behaved too they're just kind of floyd was just kind of dumb okay kind of klutzy and he was kind of klutzy and it really wasn't his fault when Use like Lloyd is so so good about pottery. Like he would step between things. So was Tidbit. She was super super good. Floyd, on the other hand, not very smart. And uh, the only thing that they really ever got, they really everybody consistently ever messed up was plates because they couldn't tell that the plate wasn't clay. It's just it's just flat, right? It's just so flat. It's like so they they'd step they on tell. it. Yeah. Um, but Floyd, <laughs> Floyd. Uh, would climb on the wall. It was either Floyd or Lloyd. I don't know. But I, um, he really liked plastic, so I'd have to cover up the mugs, right, with pl- with plastic. But then Lloyd really likes plastic, so he'd like try to get in it and play with it. So then I'd cover it up with a piece of cloth on top of it, like a like a uh, mm-hmm. you know canvas like, or something like yeah, that. yeah something like that. And so I did that with um. I did that with a towel once when I made that little studio in the back and it was like a six foot by 20 foot studio and little studio in my big studio. And the, one of them climbed up on the wall and then jumped on the towel, not knowing that there was (laughs) cups under it. And he (laughs) fucking walked all (laughs) over these cups. There was like, there was probably, you remember the stack? Yes. The um, stack that you just threw in a pile? Yeah, it was probably a stack of 40 cups. Yeah. It was... I can see that. Like, cats will just see... Like, there'll be a fucking napkin sitting on the counter, and she'll, like, curl... Like, do a little kitty loaf on the napkin. I'm like, that's a fucking napkin. Like, there's nothing yeah. for you to benefit from laying on this. Yeah, he, like, just didn't know. There was no place for him to come down on the table. Like, he was up on the wall. Like, there was no option for him so i don't blame him by any means but that was the worst for sure i mean mine would probably be like they might jump up on a board that i had you know balanced on a couple things and then you have a spot that like if there's too much weight it's gonna flip the board up a little bit yeah i probably had that once but yeah nothing like catastrophic yeah one time floyd um laid down in a pallet full of underplays (laughs) oh my gosh (laughs) He had blue all over. I had to wash him off so many times. He also accidentally fell in the reclaim. And, uh. Ooh, that would be a mess. Yeah, there was pot, little paw prints all over. And then Tidbit fell in the white glaze once. <laughs> Which we talked about in a past episode. Yeah, and that she. Was a good one. She was. Um, just flew all over my house. It was so funny. Uh, yeah, those are mine. All right. What's the next one? Um, what's something you enjoy that others may not know about you? Ryan? I fucking love stand-up comedy. Oh, yes, you do. Man, I've been, I've been looking on websites lately to see local comedy clubs that we can go see stand-up comedy. I was thinking about looking at Indianapolis to see. There actually is a comedy club near oh, you. Oh, sweet. Yeah, we should go. That'd be fun. Uh, there's some near me. We're actually going to see Theo Vaughn this weekend, which should be good. Um, yeah. I've been listening to this like <clears throat> comedy podcast the last like three weeks or something called Kill Tony. You probably don't know what that is, but Mm-mm. it's like a... They have... A, it's It's a weekly live podcast, and they have like... 
Oh, fun. They just randomly pick names out of a bucket for people that sign up for the that night. Oh, nice. It could be like 80 people, and it could be people that just started comedy for their first time, or it could be people that have been doing it for years. That's And cool. it's like they get one minute to do whatever comedy they want, and then they like interview them after they do their one minute. And oh, nice. it could nice. be fucking terrible, or it could be really good. And then normally they have like a guest comedian that is at the table with them and like talking with them. Mm. giving them advice or whatever after and then they have people that are regularly on there so i've been listening i've listened to like 30 of those episodes in the last three weeks or something so that that's been pretty entertaining i want to go to some comedy here soon yeah um i this is kind of weird but i you know this but uh, i don't think a lot of other people don't know this i don't have a tv well we kind of talked about this last week but I don't have a TV or internet in my apartment. And um, I like being disconnected and just kind of like chilling out in my apartment. And I think that a lot of people... And I love movies and stuff, but just ever since I've been to Indianapolis, I've kind of like really enjoyed not... Did you did you used to have a TV at in Washington? Like, would you watch it? And you probably didn't have a TV in the studio, right? I've never owned a TV in my adult life. Really? Yeah. Uh, one of my roommates had one. That's fucking great. <laughs> for maybe like, like, they had one for maybe like three months, but it wasn't mine and I barely ever watched it. So, um, yeah, but I've, I've never owned a TV. Um, I don't know why. It's great. I mean, good. yeah. It, I mean, that's good. Yeah. It's, it's like weird because when you say stuff like that, it seems like a negative, but it's actually not. It's, it's, pretty positive so who would think that's a negative dude I have this well well actually i mean i could see people that think it's a negative because they're like where's your tv like can we watch something yeah like, like sorry i don't have internet i've had sorry, people come over to my house and they're like this one guy was like you should have a tv here for your guests and i'm like what the f- well, well first no have you heard of a fucking laptop or have you heard of talking like <laughs> yeah <laughs> like when <laughs> We don't watch let's TV talk, at all when we when I come over to your house. Yeah, we don't really. We no. talk. We play games. We uh, yeah. eat and. Your dad watches TV, but that's it. Conversation. Yeah, like yeah. he'll usually he'll usually watch football or something. Yeah. And, or but, we'll we've been like playing music on the TV. Like you yeah. don't need a TV to play music. You can just play it on your whatever. Like, yeah, on my phone. Yeah, like I still play music and stuff, but I like to read and. And um, I'm kind of, like, getting back to, like, the simple life of things, which has been really great. So that's something that I actually enjoy that a lot of people don't know about me, so. That's overwhelmingly a positive thing. Yeah. Hooray! (laughs) Okay, that was from you, probably. I actually put that question in there because I wanted to talk about stand-up comedy. Or (laughs) F1. (laughs) Or F1. (laughs) Uh, do you think it's worth it to pay to promote your work on social media? That's from Mudslinging Pottery. Jody. I've only done it a few times. I think the one beneficial thing to promote that I've seen value out of is when I do like an individual show, like mm-hmm. the backyard craft show that is very homegrown. It's not something that's yeah. been around a while that people already know about. That's where I think promoting it is good. But it's really just promoting the event. It's not like a random post and I'm promoting a post. Um, so like that or promoting my like home studio sale. Like I'll pay 100 bucks and throw that on Facebook ads for a few week, a couple weeks or something. Like I think that's beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, I don't but. I'm not a fan of paying for a promotion. I'm a fan yeah. of seeing your face and that usually gives you more promotion than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How do you keep the cats from messing around in or drinking your throwing water? Aletha Bean. Mine don't mess with my throwing water. I just let mine drink them. (laughs) I mean, they, yeah, I mean, they've got ample water upstairs and stuff. They just don't really, like, they're not, like, some cats will be, like, if you turn the faucet on, they're, like, licking the water as it's coming out of the faucet. Like, there's some cats like that, or they'll just drink any random cup of water that's out there. Lloyd My is cats that aren't, cat. aren't really like that. 
Lloyd is definitely that cat. Because the- Lloyd like drinks off your <laughs> beer or something that's like got liquid on the. Lloyd outside. would fucking love this truly. Okay. Or <laughs> drinking Bev. <laughs> he, Lloyd drink Bev. He he, lo- he loves alcohol, but um yeah no all the cats, <laughs> all the cats have have drank uh alcohol or not alcohol uh throwing water um. They Did just they ever like up. drink the water out of your like reclaim and stuff, like the big reclaim buckets and stuff? Because those uh, are like big vats of reclaim with water on top. Yeah, those are like big vats of fucking algae. Um, <laughs> no, usually it's just the individual buckets. Like if I left a bucket out on the 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 hand building table and some clay had fallen to the bottom, they'll drink the top. Okay. If the clay water it's settled, it's really not that big of a deal. Yeah, it's really not. And there's a bunch of, you know what? There's a bunch of nutrients in the clay anyway. It's fine. Um, Is that true? Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> it sounds like you're making that <laughs> shit up, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but like, they've never like Lloyd drinks so much fucking water, so much water, and so um, I just never had. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, it's great. I just never thought it was even a bad thing. I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> like, clay water. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I all drank right. clay water on accident. We've all drank clay water. Let's be real. I'm not, maybe, but I don't know. Um, what are your favorite and least favorite things to make from Pennington Design? Yes. She's from Washington. She was one of my students. Nice. Um... Uh, favorite thing awesome. to make is wine glasses for me. You? Favorite shot glasses right now. Shot glasses. Least Love favorite. It. Probably plates. God, I fucking hate plates. I have a. It's just like I, I think it's the price point. Like I can't. For one, they take up so much space. But like selling them, I feel like is never easy. You'll get people. I'm much happier not putting any plates on the table because I get way less questions of, hey, I'm kind of interested in, like, a set of dishes. Like, can we make that happen? Like, I'm happy to not have plates out anymore because I basically have had zero of those questions this year yeah. by not having plates on the table. Yeah, I uh, actually still have to make a play setting from one of my customers back in Washington. <laughs> I was like, I'll do it when I get my kiln, but I still haven't gotten my kiln, so. Yikes. Yeah. You still have your plate racks, though, right? I gave them to Rebecca. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did you say your least favorite? Um, my least favorite is probably, uh, specifically, the Hurley plate, which is from work. It's a is slab. Is it the one that's a slab? Yeah. Yeah, it's a slab. I mean, actually, no. You know what? That's a lie. I actually enjoy throwing them. What I hate about them is that they're so finicky. Um, Do, how does that, like, is that, that's a slab that's a certain thickness and you throw it on the wheel head and you or the bat and you have to like attach it you can press it down and then you cut off the rim so it's circular and then you take a 45 degree tool and undercut it and like lift it undercut it and then you take your sponge under it and lift it up but you got to slow down the wheel while you're lifting it up and you have to have no water on the clay so that there's enough um friction so that there's torque in it so it's huh. it's a process it took me so long i remember when i first did these plates and i almost cried i was so fucking mad at like just everything like rebecca showed me how to do them and i was like okay cool and then i tried to do them and i messed up four in a row and i, and I ran over to rebecca and i was like i don't know how to do these plates i'm so frustrated <laughs> it seems like it would be really hard to make sure the clay stays stuck to the bat it's not that hard. But the like the undercutting, is yeah. it the undercutting and stuff? Mm, yeah. When you compress it down, it stays pretty well. And you have to wet the bat first to make sure it stays. I gotcha. Yeah. But yeah, I pretty much hate those the most. And I've, <laughs> Hurley is the name of a distant relative of the customer that we make the plates for. It's like her grandpa or something like that. And I'm like, fucking Hurley is a fucking ghost right now. And he's haunting us. And <laughs> and like... Oh, I thought it was like the uh, snowboard manufacturer Hurley. No. Nope. Okay. All right. What's the next question? 420 friendly? Question mark? Yeah, because it's my birthday. That's no, right. I, 
I've li- I've literally never smoked weed before. <laughs> I have smoked weed, however, it has never been a great experience. But I think that both of us agree that we don't give a shit if you smoke weed or don't. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really care. Like, I think it's great. You know, my sister uses it for medicine stuff, and, like, lots of my friends smoke weed, so I have no issues with it. I just don't smoke it. Yeah. I had, in Denver, I had, like, one of those edible cookie things once, and then yeah. maybe a couple gummies or something, and that's it. Yeah. I, me and we just not, are not friends, so, uh. Yeah, just it. I didn't really have, just nothing really happened, I don't think, but. Yeah. All right, another one from Chicken Shit Ceramics. Mm-hmm. Who, who has your favorite guest been, and who are you wanting to get on the show? I feel like we've kind of answered this in the past. Yeah. But who has your favorite guest been? Mm. I'll go. Okay. I'll say Leon. Leon. Leanne, favorite guest, and then wanting to get on the show is Florian Gatsby. Mm. I, don't, I really enjoyed Link. Oh, but Heidi. Yes. Heidi was my favorite. <laughs> Heidi was my favorite. Just the, like, the awkwardness <laughs> and the, like, how is this going? And then, like, the just, the, I just don't know. It's like, come on. <laughs> I laughed that entire episode. I, I just, I fucking love Heidi so much. Um, She was my favorite. And, and okay. I would really... I can't remember who I said who I wanted. I can't remember. I feel like you said somebody. You said Joe from Was it Old Joe? George. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't mind talking to Joe. Yeah. Yeah. The the one thing about the Heidi one, I honestly, when we got done with it, I was like, that wasn't like the best interview episode. And then I listened back to it and I was like. That was pretty enjoyable, actually. Like, yeah. It was hard in the moment because you're, like, trying to keep the conversation going, and then it's, like, just let those <laughs> moments kind of ride a little bit. Yeah. And it's um, just, like, it's funny. If you don't talk to Heidi on a regular basis, you aren't prepared for who she is. She's a, she's a very thoughtful person, and she's, you know, she <laughs> she's just who she is, and she's herself, and it's fucking great, and that's the best. <laughs> And, like, you haven't really talked to her, like, on the phone or anything, so you had no idea what to expect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you just follow somebody and you kind of know their personality a little bit, but you don't talk to them on a regular basis and you don't talk except through, like, replying to things that they do. Yeah. And it's a quick, like, back, forth, back, and that's it. Like, you don't really get much about their personality. So. Yeah. Yeah. I love this next question, Aletha. This is from Aletha Bean. It says, silicosis safety aside, because we all know, um, what's some unsolicited advice you always want to give but don't? Aletha Bean, most valuable questionnaire. Yes. Do you have one? I kind of have one. Mine is, like, the, just the whole wheel set up. I fucking hate it when people have their bucket, their water bucket, on the left side of their wheel, and they're right-handed. Like, if you're reaching into your water bucket with your right hand across your wheel to the left side, don't. Just don't. Just fucking don't. <laughs> it's like, you're making your life so much fucking harder. I don't... I don't know if this is, like, a pet peeve, but I just thought of one that's process-related. Um, when people use those tiny ash trimming tools that are about a quarter of an inch wide, and they're trimming, like, a big fucking piece, like, what the fuck are you doing? Use a trimming tool that is, like, an inch wide, or something that has some fucking surface area. That's my unsolicited advice, I guess. Yeah. That probably came yeah. off like a dick, but, I mean... Mine's, like... Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Oh, I so know what you're talking about. Yeah, like, mine's just, like, the way wheels are set up. Like, that was a very specific example. But, you know, like, when Merit started at the studio, she's our newest production thrower, she was there for a week. And everybody let her, like, get situated. And I think that somebody may have warned her, but I don't know if they actually did. I walked up, and the first thing I did was 
this is wrong. You need to fix this. And, <laughs> and I just like, I was like, you need a table right next to you. You're reaching too far. It's not going to help you. You need, And I just changed our whole setup. Yeah. And was like. And, I mean, some of it's like, it work. Some things work for some people, but also if yeah. there's no thought to it and you just put things and you're just wasting energy. Yeah. And you're like, you work in a studio that ef- efficiency and keeping your body in a good state so that you can do this for a while is important. So you being able to say, hey, you should adjust this, this, and this. Yeah. It's going to help you out so much more. It's like worth saying. Well, and I'm also the, I'm the lead potter too. So me going in and telling her to change something, completely appropriate. Yeah. Whereas, That's not unsolicited in that Man, in that man. regard but like if i was at somebody else's studio i would never fucking say that i would i would just let them do whatever they want to do you know oh uh, the the only other thing that came to my mind was like uh, i feel like this might come across as a dick but uh <laughs> sometimes when you <laughs> when you're at shows and you see like glazes people use that are just like they just are so stark and like I don't. I'm sure they're a customer base for certain, like glaze colors, but it's like there's not much interest to it. That it's like, get some something that has some variation to it, or like instead of just doing a solid color like bright yellow or something or bright red. Like I don't know. I just that's can't. a personal opinion, Ryan. I don't know. I just I just don't. Yeah. I mean, I'm not gonna say like you need to do this, but it's like that's something that's like. You could sell to so many more customers if you put a couple colors together that were interesting, mm-hmm. that would appeal, that's not something that is... Because, like, solid colors says to me that, like, you could buy something at a store that is a solid color piece. Mm-hmm. Do you like, know what? you have the benefit of the glazes and the interaction and stuff that adds some interest. Yeah. That you could just, you know, that's that's my only other thing that came to mind, but... Yeah. Do you know what Larry Bruning always said? An interesting shape should have a, a simple glaze, and a simple shape could ha- should have complex glaze. Okay. Maybe it's a combination of I see the glaze that's simple, and the form is not as good so it's like it just draws the attention to Mm -hmm. it maybe that's maybe that's why Mm -hmm. these are standing out in my mind Mm -hmm. i love this next question too what's the deal with pour overs and do people even fucking use them (laughs) chicken chip ceramics bringing in the heat (laughs) Um, i've never used a pour over but i don't drink coffee I've I've made pour overs and sold them and people do use them. Yes, a lot of people use them, uh, and uh, that's good because I have some of my mystery boxes that some people are going to be getting because I made a sample of like fifteen of them. Yeah, well, they have I to never, work well. Well, I mean, I've never I've used a couple. I yeah. kind of got the whole dimension right, but but yeah, hopefully they'll they'll get some use out of them and yeah, I, just, I mean. It's one of those things I made, and I never feel confident enough and, like, happy enough with it that I wanted to bring it out of the show and sell it. Yeah. Because I'm like, I don't know that I want to go down this road of making these. Yeah. I know many, many potters that make pour-overs and do very well making pour-overs. Yeah. Or, and have done well making pour-overs. So, yes, people do buy them, and people do use them frequently. Um, but they are hard to make right. Yeah. It's not just throwing a fucking cone and putting a hole in the bottom. Yeah. Joe from um, Old Forge Creations has a template for his that he made with Hartley Noble that you can buy. So. Mm-hmm. Does he does he carve or anything on the inside so that it actually has some like air to flow? I don't know, but you should. Because that's some of the factors that came into yeah. mind that it, it can't like glug, glug, glug because there's no air that's displacing as the yeah. liquid is going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Next question. How do you decide on what glazes to test? Do you mix different oxide percentages or go based off of others' others' successes? NZ Design Studio. I kind of laughed at this a little bit because I'm like, I don't really venture out with glazes that much. I know. But when I I have, 
I basically just pulled them from the John Britt book and then adjusted a couple things if I needed to. But yeah, I um, yeah, I think that we are not the correct people to ask this question because we are not testers uh, as much as like say like a Hammerly Ceramics or John Britt or um, yeah. somebody like who's Dante like, likes to make a lot of glazes at yeah. Earth Nation. I yeah, I'm just not that interested in the chemistry and the oxides yeah. and the the making of glazes that much i'm just like what works if i get a new one in the mix i might i'm probably going to pull it out of the john Britt book and it's probably going to be hey i want a cool you know red or raspberry or something you know yeah i um yeah i definitely searched the john Britt book and picked like 12 out that i liked and then tested all of them uh and like some of them didn't work at all like i remember i did a chartreuse that i was so stoked about and it shivered like (laughs) like magic (laughs) and shivered right off (laughs) um but but yeah i think i tested mine such a long time ago and i didn't test with different oxides and i am one of those "Eh, this should work i'm like isaac like isaac is testing some pieces right now like with glazes and he's like well i'll just test a 120 dollar vase with this and (laughs) like i'm totally like that so um I don't think he was mixing those glazes. I think those are glazed out of the yeah, box. Yeah, he but just didn't he, know how they were going to interact. Yeah, he didn't know how they were going to interact. But, um, but yeah, no, Isaac has all my glazes. Isaac. Isaac. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so I never did that. And I have, I don't know why, but for some reason, glaze chemistry came very natural to me because I think it was more of like a uh, art uh, like for some reason the the oxides, the oxides were just like paint they just to you yeah they just kind of made sense in my head so like when i did a green i was like oh i'm gonna do some yellow iron oxide with some cobalt and that turned out this like beautiful like olive green and you know why wouldn't you use like copper carbonate why don't you just shut the fuck up and like <laughs> let me be me and um, you could do either i'm just saying <laughs> copper carbonate wouldn't make it I've, the green i've that never I used i've never used a yellow ochre or oxide so i've only used like cobalt carbonate and co- copper carbs and yeah chrome oxide maybe a little bit but chrome yeah i would like and uh, yeah so i've kind of just done tests and and there's been a few that yeah you do like a certain percentage just to see if there's more like but usually I don't do more than three. And also make sure you're testing your pieces um, in pieces that are make sense. So, like, test tiles are great, but I always test in little small bowls um, because mm-hmm. I want to see how they're going to look on my throwing lines because that matters. So yeah. keep or that in mind. Like shot glasses or, you know, something that's not just a yeah simple. Did you see Kurt was making those, like, molds? And then he was selling the molds and people could pour their slips into it. And yeah, stuff that's and fucking made. dope. That's pretty cool. He said he had some trouble with it. I don't know if it was shipping it or what, but, but yeah, it was pretty cool. Oh, we haven't done the what if segments recently. Um, anyway, uh, grog or no grog, which do you prefer and why? And then they say, also, I love the what if segments. We didn't do a what if recently. No. Nope. Chicken shit, bringing it. Uh, I am... Actually, with... I would say I like the look. If it's just the form itself, I like the look with grog, personally, but I'd rather throw without grog. Because I like the metal rib stuff, and I think the metal rib with the grog forms just looks good. Mm. Than with no grog. But no grog is smoother to throw with, so... I am a firm believer in no grog. <laughs> like for your uh, for your throwing thing, or are you gonna throw with no grog? I feel like you're probably gonna be it's probably gonna be best, right? No, I'll probably throw with grog actually, because really? it'll, it'll be stronger. Okay, I'm guessing you'll get the choice of your mudworks clay, so you'll have to figure out which clay. Yeah, I'm wondering if I should do ice work, ice men with grog. It'll either be ice men or ice men with grog. Okay. I think. Yeah. I don't. I've, I can tell you, it won't fucking be Big Turtle. I was about to suggest Big Turtle. <laughs> no. Oh man. 
No, I mean, it might actually end up being Big Turtle, but I think it's too soft. And it's... What about the... Or no, Dark Star doesn't have any uh, grog in it. It's got the specs, but it's not groggy. Yeah, and I mean, like, I just need a clay that's sturdy enough. What about, enough. like, White Bear? Isn't White Bear grog? It doesn't have white bear have grog in it. White bear doesn't have grog. It's more like brown bear. I just need something sturdy enough that I can pick up and move, you know. Yeah, I and feel you, like Iceman with grog would probably be good. It's yeah. like fine grog, I think. I've yeah. never thrown it is yeah. with it, but I've seen it. Yeah, I was throwing a bunch of cups today, and and like my my pointer finger, no, my ring finger is just like wearing down. <laughs> and the one thing to remember, I guess, is you're gonna. Your water's going to go a longer way with no grog than if you do have grog. So you might have more torque with groggy clay, right? Mm. Like you're going to have to reapply water. So that Oh, that's a, a good fucking point. So maybe no grog. Yeah. This, this is going to be fun. Okay. Um, any tips on getting an even trimmed bottom? Oh, oh. Fat bottom mugs make the rock and wheel go round. Fat bottom mugs, they make the rock and wheel go round. Fat bottom mugs, they make the rock and wheel go round. Okay, moving on. Um, <laughs> I don't think that's going to come through like with us in sync, but it sounded in sync when I sang it, <laughs> but I don't think it's going to. <laughs> uh, mm. Any tips on getting an even trimmed bottom? Well, I don't know for sure what they mean by even trimmed bottom, but a center your piece. That's a big, that's big. <laughs> Make sure your piece is centered. Um, do you have an idea? I don't know. I mean, all of my mugs are flat. I just cut them off the wheel, and then I just use my thumb on the bottom edge to smooth it out. But right. if I'm trimming, I when I first learned to trim, I was always taught that you never touch the actual foot um you never trim the actual foot that's going to be flat on the table you leave that flat because you know that that was flat on the wheel Mm. and you trim away the outside part and the inside part and you leave that portion untouched oh interesting unless unless i like make a nick out of it or something but yeah and then at the end if i do want to smooth it i'll take a like a yellow r- mud tools ribbon like smooth it but i'm not touching the actual flat portion that is the actual foot mm. i'm trimming a foot on a bowl or something like that that's how i was taught interesting and that just made sense to keep it flat no it does but that's also given that your rim is flat otherwise it could be a little wonky but i think that also it it matters to not trim your pieces too wet i think that that's something that can be a huge um when you're when you're a student when you're new you know you're rushed to trim something and it's really important to get it when it's not super fucking wet because if it's super wet you can move the bottom down and that makes it uneven while you're trimming it happens all the time and so make sure your pieces are actually leather hard and they're not too wet you want them almost too dry as opposed to too wet I would say, and um, if you are having issues with the bottoms being flat, you can put a bat on top of it and tap it twice or three times or whatever, just like a quick, like that type type of tap, and that can flatten out that bottom if you do have an issue with it not being flat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, One other thing, if this is your situation if you're taking something off of a bat that you threw it on you cut it and you picked it up off of the bat and maybe it like stuck a little bit in the middle i always take that off and then i will flatten that on a piece of drywall or something that's not going to stick and i yeah. push that back flat that's a good that idea. way it goes back to a flat instead of like like i'm not touching that with my hand i'm letting a wide surface that has a big surface area it's going to flatten it on its own. It's going to naturally go back to where it was. Yeah. Instead of fiddling with it and touching it and stuff like that. Yeah. It also matters what you're trimming on. So, like, you know, if you get a Giffen grip, that's usually going to center your piece. Um, it's kind of people think it's cheating. Whatever. It's a tool. Use it if you want. You don't if you don't. Um, I use a, a foam bat if I'm trimming anything wide or small. I do as well. 
Yeah, and did you use a foam bat before you knew me? Um, before I knew you, I prob no. When I first started trimming, I did the, the I lugs. had a speedball bat, and then I did the uh, wet the rim, mm. suction it to the bat, and then trim it, and then pop it off. Yeah, I, would, I like, used to do the, it that way pick, too. Pick it up and pop it off. Yeah, I didn't really do the lug. I did the lugs before that, but that was probably like five years ago. Yeah, I and yeah. Then I so- did the sticky bat. Sticky bat is okay. I don't like that the clay sticks to the sticky back. <laughs> bat, but it depends on how wet the clay is. Yeah, I'm not. I don't usually like sponge my rim before I stick it down. I just stick ideally it, it would be leather hard or yeah. wet of leather hard. So it's I'm not talking really about enough. the trimmings. That's what I don't. Oh, know. okay. Yeah. I don't well, know. my bat, my sticky bat was like eight inches, so it wasn't really that big. Okay, nice. Yeah. Um, and I also use. I would make my own trimming bats when I used to suction the rim with. Um, it's that really, really thin foam. It's like maybe a, like half a centimeter thin. Like what you would get in a cone pack box? No. It's not even foam. It's that like, it's like the super dense, like, I don't Is know. Is it what you would get like packages with sometimes? Mm-mm. No. I'm trying to think of a scenario that you would have it. Oh, oh, um, you know, like the foam that you would stick on a window when you were a kid and it's like kind of squishy but it's not it's like hard um not really uh, i don't i don't know what you're talking about i don't either but that would be stuck to your bat or you would yeah it's it's like a sticky paper it, it's a it's got a sticky side on the back and i would stick it to the back and cut it off and um it's it's maybe a half a centimeter tall and it's real dense and so you can still suction it to it, but it's still got a little bit of a give. So it's yeah. not like gonna, you know, it's not super hard. Yeah. I think the, the softness, I didn't even think about that, but that, I mean, honestly doing a video, like talking about how you decide to trim and when you decide to trim and how you trim is probably like, I might do that actually now. You should put it on the Patreon. Oh, I was thinking about just putting it on my IGTV, but maybe. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, yeah, it's Styles. okay. I know, I know, I know, I know how to describe it. It's the same type of foam that a mouse pad is made out of. It's like that foam. That oh, like okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, hi, Charles. Uh. Yeah, that's dance shit. What was the first piece you ever sold? Maddie, one, two, three, four. Not in high school. It was probably a show that I did during my winter in between like junior, senior year of high school. And I was working out of a studio and I think we had like a holiday sale where we you set our stuff up. remember that and... far back? Yeah. Shit. Otherwise, it was one that I had like high school and it was my parents' Christmas party or something. And I set all my stuff out on the table in the corner. And when people came, like, it was there. And then some people bought it. Um, I know it was in college. I have no idea what it was. None. No clue. Mine was probably 2014, I would guess. No, no, it's further back than that. I graduated college in 2013, so... Right? Yeah. Yeah. It was probably... Damn. Is that long ago? Shit. Uh, probably 2009, maybe. Mine was probably 2010. But like oh I said, gosh. I don't know. I don't know when. Because 2009, you would have been a senior in high school. Um, yeah. 2010, I was a sophomore in college. So... It was either sophomore or junior year in college, but I have no idea what it was. I don't have any recollection of being excited or anything like that. <laughs> so Yeah, mine was probably 09, 2010, something like that. Yeah. We used to have, like, studio sales, and we made a lot of shit, so. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you the first piece, necessarily, but I could tell you the first event, probably. Yeah. But. Ooh, I like this one. What is your favorite objects to hand build? Solo flyer. Ornaments. That's literally the only thing I hand build. There you go. My favorite thing to hand build. 
Oh, I, you know, I have these large platter plates that I make that are 12 inch plates that were for planters. And those are some of my favorite things to handle because it's just, it's such a process and it's like, they turn out so fucking cool. Like when they're done, like anything large that's in a mold of some sort. Um, like, yeah, those are freaking dope. I love, I love those plates. Cause like I do the slab and I push it inside and then I put it on the wheel and I compress it down. So it's like I throw it, but I'm not throwing it and I compress it down and then, um, just let it sit for a while. They're so cool. Have you ever thrown on one of those uh, uh, production places that it's got like an uh, an outside thing and then you throw the mold inside it and you use the arm to mm-hmm. do it? I is haven't that, done is it, a, but... Is that a jig? It's is a jig. Yeah. Yeah, there was a production pottery place in Louisville that made their mugs that way and I got to do it back in high school. We like toured it. I think my mom was doing a project for her MBA there or something um and we got to tour it and stuff and I got to try it it's like really wet clay and you just pull the arm down and then you gotta like cut the excess away and stuff but it's pretty cool yeah okay I don't know why I brought that up but that's well, no, it kind of is cool because you were talking about the mold thing yeah yeah um other than that I really like making plates I think they're super satisfying. Like small four inch. Do you inch have, plates. is there a sense of cracking? Is cracking less of a thing with plates and warping with hand-built plates than it is with throwing? Mm, uh, I think warping is more of a thing, actually. And cracking is about same, same. Okay. But they're going to crack at the rims. Because it's a pretty consistent thickness. Yeah. They're going to crack at the rims as opposed to the base. So you're getting cracks in a different area. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I wonder where you guys get your brown paper shopping bags for customers. I recall Becca mentioning in an old episode that she doesn't use Uline, but I was curious where else to find these kinds of shopkeeper items at a similar price point. I actually do use Uline. A lot of, and that's the pottery mason. A lot of people don't use Uline because of the political situation that is um, happening with that. I am not one of those people that cares politically because they employ everybody. <laughs> if they if they employ people that believe all things, then I will buy from them. Um, but uh, I do use Uline. Ryan uses somebody local. Do you want to say who it is? This is talking about the shopping bags, though. Yeah. Not the, not the boxes. My my box supplier is local. My shopping bags is I either get it from Nashville Wraps lately or the Paper uh, Paper Mart. Okay. Paper Mart, I've probably gotten from them four or five times over the last few years. Mm-hmm. And then Nashville Wraps has been a newer a newer um thing in the last year or so it's it really comes down to shipping for me because the nashville wraps has their incentive is you spend x amount i say you spend 150 bucks and the shipping costs 20 bucks nice and if you spend over 300 it's like free shipping or 250 is free shipping so that's a big incentive for me the paper mart one was a long-standing one and their incentive was if you hit 200 dollars in handled bags you get 20 percent off of handled bags cost cool. but you have to pay for shipping like the last time i bought it i bought like four cases maybe maybe five or maybe it was four to six cases and the shipping for fedex was like 90 dollars. so that was like holy shit so you definitely have to factor that in and i think the price of the bags for paper mart were a little bit more and then you also paid for shipping so i actually split my order between nashville wraps and paper mart depending on what i was buying so. Yeah, and if you don't care about Uline and all the things, um, Uline shipping for like a box is like twenty bucks, and they basically don't go more than sixty, I think, for shipping freight if you buy a bunch. Or that's how it was with us because there was a there was a, a Uline facility just like 
two hours away. So it was always sixty dollars, even if we got a pallet. So yeah, I, don't I would know. say definitely have some options out there because sometimes I'll go to Paper Mart and I'll look for cub bags. Let's say yeah, and it'll say sold out, and you don't know when those fuckers are coming back in. You could yeah. set a reminder, but it could be a couple. It could be like a month and a half before it says it's yeah. in again. I so had a, yeah be ahead of the game. I had a friend that options. always bought them off of um, off of eBay. Okay. So that's a I good mean, if, place to look If for. I got real desperate, I would do the... Um, if I got super desperate, I have gone to Michael's before and bought, like, a few if I was completely out of something and I needed it desperately. Because they always throw those 40% off coupons and whatever, and yeah. you could buy a, a pack of 15. But, I mean... It's kind of like, you know, I've done that a few times. I've gone to Albertsons and gotten plastic bags. I will not go plastic bags, but I will go Michael's paper bags. You've clearly not been desperate enough. (laughs) I have not been that desperate. (laughs) But I'm also not, like, I'm getting, I'm not getting 100, like, 100 bags or something, you know. Yeah. (laughs) You probably needed a good quantity of them, that it would be financially not make sense for you to go to michael's and buy a hundred bags yeah no um okay how do you guys handle lighting at shows most of my shows are inside so i use clamp lights wherever i can clamp them but i have a few outdoor shows coming up in the fall and was wondering about lighting for outdoor shows what's your favorite way to light it up oto oh auto c pottery auto c pottery i've only done maybe two to three shows that were outdoor that were late enough um those are usually the fall ones because once you get to that time of year it gets dark at like five o'clock or whatever yeah and some of those will go to like seven so um i mean i've never had to do one where i have to have my own battery power so Mm. i i mean those shows for the most part are always going to provide electricity and i just use the the clamp lights from Lowe's that are just one single bulb and it's got the like dome metal metal clamp light and it's got the the kind of arm on it and it's got the like triangle like clamps that actually you can you can put on the top of your tent or whatever yeah and i would suggest getting a daylight bulb for that Mm, that's a good idea which is going to be brighter and it's going to be more white light instead of yellow light because i feel like my stuff looks like shit with yellow light Mm. i um i i would have like two of those in a tent oh really Maybe three but i would have like two yeah it's always tough with your like a specific setup right because like a lot of the times i'm like i don't fucking care once it gets to seven o'clock don't care <laughs> yeah i mean you're probably not selling that much that yeah. late but maybe you are i don't i mean those shows generally that are going that late have entertainment or they have food like yeah. you're not the main guest of honor here that yeah. they're there to see i think that if i was doing a show and i had shelves like the shelves that i had in my other booth i think that i would probably get those lights that you can just like kind of set down and click on you know that you could put at the top of the shelf like under it and then shine it down like on each shelf yeah because like i mean yeah you can do lights but there's always going to be weird fucking shadows from the light so um unless you did a light from the bottom looking up and a light from the top looking down but also i want to say that i a couple years ago found you can get the clamp lights that are the metal ones a couple years ago i found plastic ones at sherwin williams that are far superior far 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 superior than the metal ones they clip so much easier they don't fall apart the plastic is talking about are you talking about like a track light no they look exactly like the metal ones but they're plastic and they're so good um sorry i'm i'm not thinking what you're are you talking about the bulbs themselves no i'm talking about the clamping lights just like I'm talking about. Like a boom light. Okay. And normally the way I would position it would be I would kind of put it above and just a little bit in front of the table so it's basically shining down. That way if somebody's walking in, they're not going to block the light. Yeah. So 
mine are pretty much downward. I haven't done one in a while, so with my current setup, with like the tables on the outside edge of the booth, it would be really hard. I would probably need to put the tables further into the booth and I would probably clamp it from the edge of my booth and shine it on each side like downward at like a not a 45 degree but probably like a 30 degree kind of okay that's kind of how I would do it okay this is not the exact one however it is very similar and this is way more expensive than what I paid for them, but I figured I'd show you. So these. Can you show the screen? I, yes, I'll show the screen, but I'm going to read what it is because it's on Amazon. I looked up okay. Clamp Light Plastic on Google, and it, the brand is Keystone, and it's an A 1100 underscore UL. It's a polycarbonate clamp lamp. Okay, so the housing of it is plastic. Yeah, the housing's plastic. Okay, and it's got a cord, but yeah. What what is the price on that one? That's that, a single one. That one was twenty four, but I remember paying like ten bucks. Okay, yeah. If you go to the Lowe's and you get the clamp light, like I'm talking about, mine was probably like eight or ten bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So I always got mine at Sherwin Williams. I, they've always had them, but I also yeah, had I a would, discount. So I would never have enough. Uh, shows to invest in like track light that i need to like anchor to my tent and stuff that's just with bulbs that are angled and all that stuff yeah i i was never I, I, I was never good at like lights and tents just never good at that I, i'm just always iffy about those kind of shows like there's a there's one that happened last weekend that was called the vina colette uh wine festival mm-hmm so it's like at a winery, and you're going fucking all day. You're going like 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. to like 9 p.m. Yeah. And I'm like, like, how much are you actually oh. selling between 7 and 9 or like 6 and 9? Because people are fucking hammered by that time. Yeah. And they're just like listening to music and partying and hanging out. Yeah. And- Do you know what also uh, what Marv and Val had in their tent, which is a great idea, and I actually have these in my apartment, is I got some LED um ballast ballast lightings about uh what are those things called that like the baluster like the long light like the fucking led like lights that are like bright as fuck in um that have oh you're talking about a, like a shop light kind of but it's a yeah like light. a shop light and so they have led ones that weigh like maybe a pound and i have them in my apartment and it's a single bowl. It's like a single bowl with two. a ballast. Two. It's called a ballast, I think, is the thing that holds it in. Yeah, two of them. And they're like plastic. And they just plug oh. in to a regular outlet. And they are so fucking bright. And they would be great in a booth. I mean, you don't really need fancy light. Like, stupid. I mean, definitely go with like LED with yeah. something that's got white light. Or like brighter light. That is not yellow and not like fluorescent because it's. I feel like your stuff is not going to look as good, like just like if you're out in the sunlight, your stuff looks way better in the sunlight than it is in your house under lamp light. Yeah. So okay, I found the okay. There the it's called. I'm sure that this isn't exactly what I got, but um, linkable like a, LED shop light. Um, I feel super like that'll bright. look kind of trashy though in your tent. No, they look great because you you put them high enough. You put them high enough and Maybe. you can link them all together. And it was it's 50 bucks for, um, you know what, it just shut like up. It looks like you got a fucking garage in there. <laughs> no, it doesn't. People don't look at that shit. You, you're in a fucking tent, Ryan. You're in a tent. No, I'm saying your tent is going to be fucking glowing. Everybody else is going to be pitch black compared to yours. Yeah, and people are going to be like, oh my God, it's like the Star of David. Like, they're... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your, tent, your tent's going to be glowing from the light. <laughs> It's, I meant, like like 50, it's like 50 bucks for a fucking shop light. They're going like, to be like, can you take your top off so we can just like use the light against your neighbor's <laughs> light? Like, it's like, they don't have light. Stop it. It's like 50 bucks for four of the lights. And they do look really good. If you put them all in all four, they'll light up your, okay. t- your tent. Like people will flock. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you have a show that late, make sure you take your own wine. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. Just... just just get a fucking water bottle, pour some red wine in it, 
and have it for dinner. I feel like that's the same with those like music festival shows. Yeah. I've stayed away from those because I've heard things from people that do them that is like, like they're not there for art. It's like you're doing a music festival and the planner thought it was a good idea to like add some art in the mix. Yeah. But like. It's not conducive for people to want to buy something and carry it around while they're at a music festival. The only festival that I would probably sell it is a fucking jazz festival. Because unless, unless you have like consumable things like you you sell like popcorn, or like yeah, something like, they can eat in the moment. People that listen to jazz are like rich. <laughs> okay, next one. <laughs> Moving on. If both of you could never do the career path that you currently have, so no clay including Ryan's so no clay, comma, including Ryan's tech stuff, comma, what would you do for a living? Question mark. <laughs> Mudhead's pottery. Mine would be some boring shit like accounting. I feel like that would be my my uh I wouldn't call it boring shit, but like hey, I'm a numbers guy. You are my my major was either gonna be something in tech or like business. Yeah. I didn't know if I wanted to, like, run a small business, but I think business was my go-to. Hmm. I don't know if that was because I was like, oh, I want to make the ceramics a small business, but I would have done something like that, probably. Yeah. Well, let's see. I would probably be an industrial designer. Or an engineer. Both of you could never do the career paths that you currently have. Okay. So would you have would you have ever like when you were in college would you have majored in that? Yeah, but yeah. my college didn't have a didn't have that option. I what almost would you went. Have ma- what would you have majored in for something like that? Industrial design or like yeah. m- engineering or? Well, I could have majored in engineering, but um, yeah, like if industrial design is like an actual major, and I didn't really learn about industrial design until too late. Is so, that a specialized major? Like, it's not going to be at all schools? Or is it yeah. just called something different? Like, there's more generic name. It's like for product it. design. Oh, okay. Yeah. I gotcha. So it'd be like making a fucking can opener. That's not mechanical engineering, right? No, that's just design. Like design. industrial design. Yeah. And would that fall under an art kind of Architecture. Program? architecture okay so like an yeah. engineering architecture yeah school of arts and sciences kind of thing yeah yeah so i would be an industrial designer for sure i always wanted to be, make furniture do woodworking furniture and i like I always had all these designs for furnitures and stuff yep that's that would be my go-to I are almost... those are those like corporations and stuff that have like or you would work in a shop that like made stuff by hand and you got to design, like, come up with designs for them. I mean, you could do either. It's like you could work for OXO, you know, that makes all those kitchen gadgets. Like, there's so many things that are, like, oh, made. Oh, I gotcha. You know, like, like fucking designing your computer or uh, designing the chair that's across the way from me or designing a table or designing a gotcha. can opener or a spatula. And you still have to factor in, like, ergonomics yeah. and function mm-hmm. and, like size and efficiency and stuff like that yeah material yeah options but other than that i'd probably do engineering like a mechanical engineer cool yeah, yeah. Or, or accounting i really do like numbers as well something yeah. in finance i feel like i would i don't know I, I mean i don't think i'm that interesting as it is but i feel like i would be less interesting if i did that <laughs> career path like no no hobby like like, i don't know what my hobbies would be like i don't know you just get so into like (laughs) like what you've been doing for like 10 years that it's like what would my time be spent doing totally my free time i guess totes my goats man totes okay any plans for adding more cats to either of your situations chicken chip ceramics well i just added a cat so no more after that babs is my new cat babs babs she um a lot of people have followed her on instagram but yeah babs and lloyd they sound like an old married couple because that is what they are that fight and there's a lot of 
a lot of neglect and abuse in this lot, relationship. There a lot of, is there a lot of hissing and a lot of... <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of a lot of Lloyd coming up and being like, Whack! <laughs> or, or yeah, when he when he like when they're on the bed and then he like uh, then Lloyd, uh, Babs turns around and goes, and then he jumps off the bed and he goes, and then he walks in the living room and he goes. <laughs> that's great yeah uh, he loves playing with her and she fucking hates it and it's hilarious <laughs> yeah i i don't think we plan on having any cats added to the situations yeah no more cats your cats are a lot yeah i i feel like they're good together i mean i see the allure if somebody has a single cat and you're like like i don't know how much cats care about like i need somebody else there they but care it de- I think it de- does it depend on the personality of the cat? Sometimes, yeah, but like a lot of the times they care, especially if they're younger, um, and you're not there, you're not home all the time. Like if you worked at home and you had a single cat, it'd probably be fine. But um, like they they're like my shadow, yeah. Honestly, yeah. Like they'll go eat or whatever, and then after they get done eating, they're like, "All right, where's Dad at? Where, where's he at?" And they'll like come yeah. up, like they came up after work, and I was still st- sitting up here on the couch, and they like came up here and like sat on the by the window and. Yeah. I was up here. Yeah, like, I'm never home, so, like, Lloyd needs a buddy, you know? He needs somebody that he can torment. <laughs> yeah. Somebody. All somebody right. How, how Bats Ceramics asks, how long can a brand new kiln go without changing elements? Mine is two and a half years old with 60-ish firings. Do you want to answer this or do you want me to answer this? I mean, I think there's a number of variables here. There's what what rating is your kiln, like what temperature is it rated to go fire to? What are you firing it to? And then I would guess that the speed of the firing is probably a big factor. Yes. Like fast, slow, medium kind of thing. And yeah. then like the number of firings. And the care of your kiln too. So yeah. You're looking at, yeah, so, I mean, 60-ish firings on a 2.5 years. It's not really about how many years. It's more about the firings. It also matters about the elements without within your environment. So, like, if you're in a really humid space or if you're in not humid space, if you're firing outside, if you're firing inside, um, temperature controlled. Uh, but short answer, if you had a cone 10 kiln, and you're firing a cone six consistently. Mm. And you're bisking in there too? Yeah, so cone six and cone O six. So like let's yeah. say half half. Um, and you're doing slow, slow fires, you're probably gonna get like hundred and fifty to two hundred firings out of that. If you're doing everything correctly. Damn. Yeah, like you could. I mean, and and then you're going to um you, and then you it's need like to a, like it's like a step. It's like step ladder, right? So it's mm-hmm. like if you did medium, that would probably go down to what? 120? I, I don't know. I mean, like, it depends. I mean, like, this is from, this is like speculation, of course. I'm not like talking to like Scud or anything, but when I had my Cone 8 kiln and I was firing bisque almost only, well, bisque and glaze in that to Cone 6, I got 100 firings out of it and then it was almost done. I think it was like 113. And the guy was like, you did good, you know? So I feel like with a cone 10 kiln, you're going to get so much more out of that. And if you're not firing it to its peak, you know? But also, I mean, you're going to be changing out elements and stuff. You want to be vacuuming out that kiln. You want to take care of it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say you have plenty more to go if you're at a cone 10 and you're at 60-ish firings. But are we... Yeah, brand new kiln. Yeah, that's a good... I mean, 60 firings, two and a half years, like, I feel like you're on a good track. Like, if mm-hmm. if it's lasted you that long, like, you're probably good for another year at least. Yeah. Oh, I would given, say Given that you're on years. the same... You're on the same trajectory of, yeah. like, firings. Man, Mackenzie's kiln that we just took out of the... Out of Graves Co. has never had the elements changed. You can't even fire it on fast... It has to be on slow, and it can only go to, like, a certain temperature. 
Why is that? Just because if it goes too fast, the element, the elements are like, fuck you. <laughs> oh, like they will be temperamental and they won't. Mm-hmm. They it'll won't kick hit. the kiln off. They won't hit okay. temp. See, I never fire slow except for the bisque firings. I fire Josh's program. I would assume that's equivalent to a slow. But in, like, the whole medium thing, like, I don't have a set program for medium glaze, so I never really do that. Yeah. I mean, I feel like mine last... Would you say uh, two of Josh's firings would be the equivalent of, like, one glaze firing? Oh, I don't know. How does a bisque, a bisque compare to a? Because I don't know. I mean, you're not, I think you're not the testing glaze, those elements. As a bisque much. firing can be just as damaging as a glaze firing because the moisture that's in the bisque. So I don't think that it's necessarily how high the temp goes, but, but like the moisture is gone. Wouldn't the moisture be more of a risk when it's the the elements the are moisture isn't the gone. hottest? You st- well, I mean it's. It's gone when you get past 200 degrees. It's firing it off. Yeah, but you're still, that's still like in your elements and mixing with your elements at the beginning of that firing. Yeah. given I mean, you're, you're, dra- you're venting it though. That's pulling. Potentially, but not necessarily. Yeah. I, I would, I would guess the, the, the organics and stuff coming off of a glaze firing are more damaging. Besides the heat, temperature is more damaging to the elements than a bisque organic firing off. I don't know. I don't know. You read the next question. I'll Google it. All right. Next question. For markets, is there a certain amount that you would not pay to be in a market? Do you think about which other vendors are there and if the quality of work will match yours? That is from Alexa Michelle Pottery. Certain amount you would not pay to be in a market. That is going to be a factor. It's going to be more of a factor. That question is going to come in mind if it's the first time I'm ever doing it. If I've never done the market before, I'm going to be weary about something that's more than like 250 bucks usually that's kind of my like some of the good art shows are going to cost you 250 bucks or 300 bucks to do like a juried art show so sometimes you got to take that risk but those are usually well established ones that can get away with charging that if it's a brand new show that I've never done before and um you know I'm I'm going to be weary about paying it if uh if it's more than, you know, 200 or something like that. 200, 250 is kind of my my sweet spot for, for that. Um, but I, I think there's factors that come into it. If it's a... I will also s- stay away from shows that are brand new for the most part. I heard this on another Potter talk about this. She, If you go to shows a lot and you go to jury shows you will commonly get people that will come up to you and like give you a flyer about a show that's coming up and they'll say, Hey, you should apply for this show. It's coming up. Like if they're trying to get people to do their show within like a month of the show happening, that's way too late in my schedule to usually fit it in. But also like if they're still trying to fill up spots that late, they're not filling up like one to two spots. They're trying to like fill out their, their show. So I'm usually a little weary about those too. Even if it's like a $50 booth, like, I mean, I'm usually, like, I want a more established show at this point in my selling career that I want to know what to expect. I don't usually do brand new shows that, um, that I don't at least have an idea what I'm getting myself into and what the other makers are going to be, um, this second part of this question was, do you think about what other vendors are there? I do. I want to know if they're selling handmade stuff, if they're selling, you know, fall decor that they're made out of wood or, like, yarn or something. Or is it, like, well-crafted stuff? Or is it, like, holiday decorations? Like, I'll be a little iffy about some of that stuff, you know, versus... Because that that price point, those customers are coming expecting to spend no more than, like, 25 bucks, probably. Mm Mm-hmm. 
and my target range of like prices is probably more around 35 bucks you'd my be surprised actually those those christmas but... markets those those old ladies they buy a lot of shit i mean they probably buy a shitload of spoon rests probably some mugs but like i can probably leave some bowls like they're probably not gonna buy a lot of bowls and maybe some oil bottles but yeah I mean, those are, but those are generally going to be low cost shows that are going to cost you 25 to 30 bucks for a, a booth. Yeah. I have something to add to the last question. I'm not going to answer this question that you just answered because you're much more qualified than I am. Um, two things I feel like we should mention. You need to be venting your kiln in some regard if you want to keep your elements lasting longer. Uh, I just looked up this forum. And this guy, uh, well, it was mostly about peepholes, but if you don't have a vent, make sure your top peephole is open so that at least some air gets in to the kiln. And you should be leaving your lid cracked about an inch for the first, like, thousand degrees of the firing. Um, if you can. I have a question about the peephole thing. If the kiln is really, really hot on the inside and the, the air temperature outside of it is cooler and the peephole is out... Where is the air going? Is the air going toward the heat, or is the heat going toward the cooler air? I don't know. <laughs> That's why I'm saying, like, is are you saying it to say that you're getting air to come into the kiln? I think so. I would it's like oxygen. guess that the hot air is trying to get out. I think the hot air is sucking the oxygen in. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, moving on. Um, he said, during the first stages of firing... Organic and sulfur compounds are burned off, released from the clay, causing that rotten egg smell during the bisque firing. The natural sulfur in the clay forms sulfur dioxide, sulfides, and sulfates, which corrode your bricks and elements as well as items near your kiln. Trapping these sulfur compounds in your kiln can also affect your glazes, dulling both the colors and the surface of the glaze. Your whole studio needs mm. to be vented. Breathing these fumes is not good for your lungs, blah, blah, blah. So, um... Yeah, so that could that I think that this would potentially suggest that the bisque is actually more damaging to the elements than the glaze. But he didn't mention But it glaze. doesn't talk anything about glaze and your glazes are completely varied based on what glazes you use. So, you can't really speak to that, right? I know, I'm just saying. Cuz there's an unlimited number of glaze things. Clays are very <laughs> in a lane of like options of what clays are made out of that you know what they're going to produce, right? I'm just saying that <laughs> the bisque is potentially harmful. No, I assumed there was there was things burning off that you need to get, yeah. You know, ventilation essential. Yeah. For your kiln's longevity. All right. I think we answered the market one. Um yeah, I definitely consider all those things. I would say like don't don't feel like you can be a little, you know, I don't want to say desperate, but you can you could find some shows and be like, you know what, I do want to do a lot of shows that I'm not really sure about. Because when you first start selling, you don't really know what to expect. So, like, get those repetitions in and, you know, spend 25 bucks or 50 bucks for a tent for a booth and see how it goes. Be a little bit iffy if the tent is, like, 100 to 150 bucks, like... Those can be a little bit more of a test of like, you know, you might not get out what you put into it, but, you know, you might, I mean, as long as you make your money back at a minimum and you're just kind of trying it out early on, I would say it's not terrible. As long as you're not like traveling like three hours to do it or something. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, I also like to start close, you know, when I first started, start local to you do the areas you know you know you know you might know some people in that area that are just coming out to support you for the first time and you can get some customers that way that's not a bad way to build a customer base so okay next question these are this is our final questions i have a question for ryan and he has a question for me okay what are we doing first uh you want to I'll, I'll ask yours okay all right, so if you, if you got a free 
$40,000 and your bank account had to stay the same a year from now. So you only had that money to spend on whatever you're going to do for this year. Where would you travel or do for the whole year? I would, with my $40,000. You can't gain any money. You have to just use that money. No gain. And it's going to be, it's going to be gone if you don't. Yeah. So I want to hit a zero budget. Yes. Um, I would buy a shitty ass van. I had a feeling you were going to say something like this. <laughs> I would buy a $5,000 van or something like that and then outfit it and then just just drive. Just drive all over this fucking country. $30,000 or 20, even $20,000, I could easily I could easily live off of $20,000. Fuck yeah. You I mean you lived off less than that for the last <laughs> like 4 years of your life at least. I know. I could easily, like, you buy one meal a day or just fucking peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and just drive around, meet people, get drunk at bars. I feel like that's a lot. What I mean, what if it was $20,000? No, Still. we're staying with forty. Give me a little, <laughs> all right, okay? All right, all right. that's cake. plenty. I, that's plenty. <laughs> I deserve forty. <laughs> what if I bought so where, a fancy where, van for $10,000 and then... I mean, have, I feel like you... I mean, you could probably spend five thousand dollars on a van and then trick it out for five thousand. You could yeah. probably get a pretty good setup for ten thousand. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, and I just travel around and just shoot the shit with people and meet Fucking people. Hike everywhere. I would not hike. Not hike. <laughs> <laughs> I would Who go would to lakes. Like, would you? Like, would you just try to hit like all the states and paper map it up? I just buy paper maps and just like route my trails. <laughs> And how do you how do you like to drive? I like we to drive. We talked about this on our trip. I like to drive 150 miles tops a day. And okay. I just oh, and I I meant like how do you like travel? What do you mean? That is not like do you travel interstates? Do you travel oh, non interstates? No 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 do no you no. no point A to point B. Like how do you do this? No interstates. Only back roads and highways if you must. And um, and I'm a big fan of saying left or right and just going one way or the other. Um, like, I got lost in Michigan once, and it was fabulous. Uh, and, like, I will get use a GPS to get me out of that kind of stuff. But, yeah, I like to just, just drive. Are you like, I need to end up in this city? No. Tonight? No. Just drive until you feel like you found a place. And then once you find a place, you find either a campground or a hotel to park in. And then you just chill out there for a little while. If I had a whole year, I'd spend a lot more time in places. For sure. But I'd hit every single fucking state. I can guarantee you that. And I'd go into Canada, too. Nice. Would you plan it around, like, seasons at all? Like, make sure you avoid certain places during, like, the winter or, you know, stuff like that? I would make sure that I hit Vermont and and New Hampshire in the fall. In New York nice. in the fall. Um, because that's beautiful. And I've done that before, and it's, it's good. Um, but no, other than that, no. Maybe, like, not the hot months in the south. You know. Yeah. That'd be great. I'm down. Let's do it. When are you going to give me $40,000? <laughs> when this podcast blows up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my question to Ryan is, which F1 track would you want to go to the most? For a race. For a race. Oh, you asked me this earlier. And, uh, the first one that came to mind was Abu Dhabi, but I feel mm-hmm. like that track is not that entertaining. Uh, but you kind of want to go to Abu Dhabi? Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Um, I think that's an appropriate that's, response. And that's also the final race of the year. At least it has been the last few years. Yeah. But typically by that time, the last few years, it's been a null race. Like, it hasn't been important because the, the champion has already been decided, like, four right. races prior. So. 
I don't know. I feel like uh, I feel like some of these in like the uh, Florence, Italy one was pretty cool last year. I was thinking that. I was actually thinking that. Which I think is e- Imola. Mm-hmm. E- Imola. That's is the one the where Ferrari like showed up, right? It was like Ferrari's like hundred or whatever. Yeah, they. Uh, it's actually outside of Florence, probably by an hour or so. That would be cool. Yeah, that would be really cool. Because obviously, you go there, you like see the city and stuff, and then mm-hmm. you go to the race. It's not like you just go. Mm-hmm. And some of them are in just like random, um, just like random places that are like out in the country. Yeah. Like I was watching one a couple weeks ago where it was in Hungary, and they had like twenty, th- like eighty five percent, or no, it was like. 90 something percent of the people that came to the race traveled by bicycle jeez so it was like you know uh 20 i think they said it was like twenty thousand bikes or something jeez. so they just had this huge field and they showed just a bunch of bike racks oh with a bunch God. Of, it was nuts i think that was in hungary it's crazy that's crazy but yeah there's some cool ones i feel like australia would be probably pretty cool mm. i don't know yeah. Yeah. I think we might try to pencil in a Formula One race next year. They're going to be in Miami, and they're going to be in Austin I'm next so year, down. I believe. So. Can we go to the Texas one? I've never been to Texas, and I need to cross it off my list. That'll be in Austin. Yeah. We have I a place like to stay in be... Austin. Do we? Yeah. Oh. We can go see some live comedy there. Yeah. A lot of good comedy there. Didn't uh, Joe Rogan move there? Yes, that's yeah. that's part of the reason that the comedy's really hot, and that's where the that's actually where Kill Tony is hosted. He oh, does nice. it live every Monday at this bar. Sweet, so down comedy. Yes, okay. I think that one's gonna be more entertaining too because it's actually at a circuit that's like for racing. It's not like a street thing where they because the street ones historically are kind of like they're kind of tight, so like there's not a lot of passing because it's yeah. very tight streets and there's just not a ton going on like monaco is not yeah historically a that's like a party one but it's not like an entertaining race they're partying because they can't see the race yeah it's like you come around this corner it's like all right you got about half a fucking second all right see yeah ya. sweet <laughs> thanks at least a circuit you can like look over the field and like see yeah. a few turns yeah yeah i'm so down for that i want to do that yes i think that'll be next fall cool Sweet. Love it. All right. Okay. I think that's everything. Wow, we, we hit two hours. We said we were not going to hit two hours, but we did. <laughs> I was like, it's going to be 1230 by the time we're done, and then guess what? It's 1225. <laughs> well, we started later today. So. We did. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed the those questions. Keep them coming. We will. Uh, we always like doing these episodes, so it, it catches us up on like 15 to 20 questions, and then you give us more. Which we like. Yeah, so. they're super fun. Sweet. Okay. Peace. All right. Bye. Yo, yo, higgity, yo. It's Becca here. Hey, just so you know, thank you for listening. And also, we have... What do we have again? A Patreon. A Patreon. We have a Patreon that you should go and if you want to donate to, you could donate to it. If you don't, that's cool too. But um, just Google... Wheel Talk Podcast Patreon. Don't do the other one because uh, there is a Wheel Talk on Patreon, but it's not us. So make sure you get the right one. It's and in the show notes. It's in the show notes. And also, um, leave us a review because they're fun to read. Okay, bye.